Stories are the language of the soul. They have a way of penetrating the heart in a way few other influences can. This is why Jesus used storytelling so often to illustrate deeper truths. He knew the power of a story to cut through to the heart. These now famous stories are known as parables. They were Jesus' way to communicate an important kingdom principle in a form that we could remember and that would meet us where we are at. Although the details of these stories were fictitious, the kingdom principles are not. Today, they continue to remind us who God is and what he calls us to be a part of and how much he loves us. shout a big hallelujah. hallelujah. Amen. Amen. If you're the most blessed person, can I hear your loudest hallelujah? hallelujah. Amen. 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 We have blessed people here. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. You know, here at AOM, our vision is to do what? Amen. To raise up anointed disciple makers who are empowered to change the world for Christ. Amen. Amen. What is this year? Our year of what? Great, great. 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 Somebody say great grace. Great, great. Say with me, this is my year of great grace. This is my year of I'm an anointed disciple maker. I'm empowered by the Holy Spirit. This is where the anointing overflows. If you believe that, can you clap for Jesus? Hallelujah. So today we are starting a new sermon series uh, titled Grace Demonstrated. Grace Demonstrated. It's going to run for a couple of weeks. And this series is based on the parables, you know, that Jesus told when he was here on earth. And in these parables, we see kingdom principles, we see the demonstration of the grace of God. And that is one beautiful thing about Jesus. He is the greatest of all teachers. And one of the best ways to teach something is to tell a story. Somebody say story. story. You see, somebody can preach for one hour. You might forget the main points that he mentioned. But you remember the story. Because there is something wired in us about story that will relate to. Because a story, you can see yourself in the picture. You can see the happenings in your environment in the picture. And your brain can register. And Jesus was so good in using stories to communicate. A lot of times when Jesus wanted to communicate something very important, a profound truth, a kingdom principle, he would tell a story. The beautiful thing about the stories of Jesus 
that we now call parables, he will tell it in such a way, he will use something familiar, but there is a twist that will shift the audience. And I believe as we go through uh, this series, we're going to learn a lot uh, from these parables. And we're going to understand more the, the, the heart of God. We're going to understand more the grace of God. We're going to appreciate more the, the, the dealings of God with us. And we're kicking off this series with a, a message tied to the prodigal son. Somebody said the prodigal son. A lot of times when I read this story, I think the title should be the gracious father. When you look at all the characters, the elder brother, the younger brother, the father, who are the main characters, you know, in the story, one thing that was consistent was the father was gracious. Gracious. But the key is this, we must never take the grace of God for granted. Our God is a gracious God. He is also a consuming fire. Paul said, must we continue in sin that grace may abound? He said, by no means, no way. Hallelujah. Because we are different. Say with me, I am different. God has brought us into the family of God and his grace has been made manifest to us. That's going to lead us to the first point we must consider this afternoon. And that is very crucial. In all your dealings in life, as you navigate through life, do one this thing carefully. Make good choices. Make good choices choices. Your choices will determine where you will end up. Your choices, the little choices you make day by day will determine your tomorrow. Don't dwell in your past. Your past is gone. You cannot change your yesterday, but you can change your tomorrow by the choices you make today. That is why today is called present. It's a gift to you to be able to shape your tomorrow. It's a gift. Make good choices. This story started this way in Luke chapter 15. It started this way. Jesus said there was a man who had two sons. There is nothing wrong in having two sons. This man had two sons. The older one and the younger one. They've been living happily. They've been living happily. A lot of times when we read the parable of the prodigal son, a lot of times people will think the prodigal son is an unbeliever. No, he's a son. He's not outside. He's part of the family. He has a relationship with the father. He's not an unbeliever that is out there. He is someone that is in the family. There were two sons. Two sons. They've been living together. The father has been grooming them and they've been growing in and I'm walking. There is this father-son relationship that was there that is so beautiful. You see, one of the greatest bonds you can ever have is a relationship between child and parent. There's something very special about that bond. But in a broken world, some people, you know, God went through a lot of changes and challenges in life that affected them. But one thing I can tell you, it doesn't matter what you passed through before, Jesus can rectify it. Jesus can bring a transformation. Jesus can bring healing. Jesus can give you the love that you missed in your childhood. Only Jesus can do that. And you have these two sons in this family. Now the younger son did the unthinkable. He came to the father and said, Father, I've been watching you. I know when you die, I'm supposed to receive half of your inheritance. But I want it now. 
Basically, the son is saying, why are you still alive? I don't want to be under your leadership. I don't want to be under your control. I don't want to be under your guidance. I want my freedom. Why are you still here? In my place, we'll call it a taboo. In almost every culture I know, you don't ask your father for your inheritance when he's still alive. But this boy did it. He must have rehearsed it, thought about it, perhaps spoken with his friends. Then he gathered the boldness to come to the father and say, Father, I'm tired of being under your control. I want to run my own life. I want to do things my own way. I don't want to be under your rulership. I don't want to be under your direction. He said, in this culture, making that statement can lead for you to be stoned. But the Father, being very gracious, honored that request. God has created you as a person who can make choices. And God will honor your choices. Even though the father was heartbroken, he still honored it. There are a lot of times we make choices, we make decisions that will break the heart of God. But God in his grace will still allow us. God cannot force you. He loves you too much that he cannot force you. Do you know one thing? True love can only exist if there is choice. True love can only exist if there is choice. If there is no choice to choose to be with somebody, that is not love. That person is only a robot that you control. God loves us so much and he wants that relationship so much, but he wants it to be genuine. The son came to him and said, give me my own portion. God will not force you to stay. God will not force you. God has a plan for you. God has a future for you. God has an amazing, bright future for you. But he will not force you to do what is right or wrong. He will tell you. And when you miss your way, he will still talk to you. But he will not force you. He will not force you. But one thing I know about God, even though he doesn't force you, he will break everything around you. He will begin to move things around you. He will continue to draw your attention and say, this is not who you are. This is not me supposed to be. This is who you are. I have chosen you. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You are my beloved daughter and son. And you need to be in the family. He won't force you, but he will break things around you. I tell people this. If God's hand is upon you, stop running from him. It's either you enter the train and enjoy the ride or you will still arrive at the destination in pieces. Arrive in peace. Enjoy the ride. Or oppose the train but you still get to the destination. The father was in pain over that decision but he allowed him. What the Bible say in verse 13, not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country and squandered his property in reckless living. The first thing we see about the son, he traveled as far away as he get away from the father. He could have enjoyed the resources just within the neighborhood. But he made a decision, I want to be far away from my father. I want to be far away. Over my little years of walking with God, what I've discovered is 
I have met a lot of people who were so much on fire for God back home. But when they come to China, you'll be like, what happened to you? What happened? If people who know them back home hear about them now, they'll be like, what is that? May God have mercy on us in Jesus' name. May you always be serious with God. Don't follow your classmates, your friends to do things because you're different. There is a calling of God upon your life. What they will do and escape when you do, you'll be in trouble. That is God pulling you back. I would say he traveled far away. Far away. And he lived in this reckless life. And that's what sin does. When you begin to engage in sin, you want to run far away from God. Want to run far away. The Bible said, the hand of God is not too short to deliver. His ear is not deaf to hear. But sin has created a barrier between us and God. Do you know one thing? The father of the prodigal son was always at home. Waiting. Waiting. But the son was moving far away. May you never run far away from God. May you always draw near to God. May you not allow any circumstance to pull you away from God because God loves you too much. He loves you too much. He went there and engaged in reckless life. See, when you're running away from God, you're running away from the protection and the provision of God. That's what you're running away from. God's protecting you and God's providing for you. Don't run away from it. Actually run to it. That's where you belong. That's your heart. Some of us may say, I'm not like the prodigal son. But every backsliding starts small. Him walking away from the father to the far wild land, he had to take step after step. Step after step, moving away. Step after step, moving away. What is it that you think is a blockage between you and God? It's time to just break it. Hallelujah. The presence of God is what we need. But the bad news of this is it will always end in a disaster. Always. Always end in a disaster. The Bible said, when he has spent everything, verse 14 and 16, a severe famine came. <laughs> Somebody say severe famine. God knows how to get your attention. He knows how to get your attention. As long as the hand of God is upon you, it doesn't matter where you run to. He will get you there. I said there was what there was a severe famine in that country. Of all the nations, only way he went to that was famine. There was severe famine in that country. Where he was coming for, there was no famine. Everything was flourishing. But where he went to, there was famine. He could have made a plan and just plan things. Okay, this time I'm going to invest the money. This is what I will do. This is what I will do and all that. You know, but as the money was going, God was breaking the ground. Every investment, shh. That was severe famine. And the Bible says, and he began to be in need. He began to be in need. 
he started looking for job. This was a man that had so much money. He was the talk of the town. He was the new arrival. He had friends. But all those friends, they abandoned him. There are a lot of people that can be around you and they'll be shouting, you know, screaming and praising you. No, no, no. It's not after you. It's what is in your pocket. Once that is finished, they will go and look for the next pocket. Is somebody hearing me? Don't live your life to be popular. You are not in a popularity contest. Is somebody hearing me? You have to live your life based on the guidance and direction of God. Don't try to impress anybody. Don't try to impress anybody. It was so bad for him. He was at a point of desperation. All his friends had left. Nobody wants to help him. He started looking for job. I like, I like the story of Jesus. He's talking to Jewish audience. They don't eat pork. Talk less of raising it. And they said, this man was looking for job. He went and found a job where they raise pigs. He's completely unclean to start with. Now, it was so bad, he wanted to eat the food of the pig. You know, when you eat pork, you don't even understand where the race pig, how it looks like. Bacon tastes good, hallelujah. But back home, if you go to where they are raising pig, you don't want to eat it. There are some places here with some modern, you know, pig farms that look clean. Back home, hey, you see them rolling in the dirt like, What? Even if you bring out the pig and wash it, five minutes, they will go back to the mud. Because that's what they enjoy. Immediately, Jesus made the twist. They were like, Ay, he's eating the food of pigs. That they, Jesus is trying to say, this man has went so low and has gone below low. If there is anything like that. Hallelujah. He has gone to a point that nobody can agree to talk to him. May God have mercy on us in Jesus' name. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12, there is a way that seems right to a man, but the way end is the way of death, the way of destruction. You know, one of the things, you know, I love, I love message translation. Sometimes it's kind of a commentary, hallelujah, on the text. It says this in a contemporary way that it will hit you. They said, no, it said, it said, oh, but the end is the way to death. Yeah, yeah, it's death, yeah. But look at what it says here, message translation. It said, there is a way of life that looks harmless enough a way of life that looks what? Harmless enough. Look again. It leads straight to hell. I love the second part. Sure, those people appear to be having a good time. But all that laughter will end in heartbreak. Hey. All those laughter will end what? In heartbreak. You see some people, they just look, they are so happy, they want to go to a club and do this, boyfriend, girlfriend. They end, they will come into you crying. Please pray for me. May God have mercy in Jesus' name. True joy is in Jesus. 
don't look at people and think they are happy. No, no, no. A lot of people you see, they may be driving flashy cars. There is nothing wrong with flashy cars. Or living big house, you know, or dressing very expensive. But when you get close to their life, you'll be like, what is happening here? There used to be one soap opera that was so popular back home. You know, it says, the rich also cry. They all, when they come out, everybody is smiling. It's like, you know, the royal family. There is a way you walk, the way you wave your hand. But when you go inside, know what is happening. You don't want to be that kind of royalty. May God help us in Jesus' name. Make good choices. Look at everybody and say, neighbor. Make good choices. Make good choices. Make good choices. Don't make choices that will destroy your family, that will destroy your marriage, that will destroy your education, that will destroy your career, that will destroy your work with God. They may look glamorous. You may be happy at the beginning, but the end will end in tears. The one thing I understand about God, everything God tells us to do is for our good. There is nothing you do that will change the holiness of God. Nothing can add to it. Nothing can subtract from it. But he's telling us what is good for us in order to do what? To guide us. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor. God knows better than you. Follow his leading. Secondly, return quickly to your heavenly father. Return quickly. Whenever you see that you have missed the mark, run quickly back to your father. Technique of the devil, whenever you fall into sin, you see yourself in sin, is the devil will come and condemn you and tell you you're so dirty that you can't approach God. Have you ever noticed if you do something wrong, you struggle to pray? Because you just feel like what you did is so bad. And then the devil will amplify it and tell you how bad you are. That you shouldn't approach a holy God. But who can clean you? It's God. If you don't go to him, you will not be clean. Bible said in verses 17 and 18, Bible said, when he came to himself, when he came to himself, some translation said, when he came to his senses, don't wait too long until you start eating the food of pig to come to your senses. He could have come to his senses earlier on. Immediately he lost everything. He could have said, let me go back home. And the father will receive him. Betting his arrogance. He said, I'm not going to make it. I don't want to be under the control of this man. I'm going to fight through. But he was languishing in hunger. In desperation. The first step to true repentance is to realize that you have sinned. Realize your true state. There are people that will give excuses. Oh, it doesn't matter. It's only a mistake. No, no, no. Sin is sin. Don't give it any baptismal name. Hallelujah. In our generation, we have a lot of baptismal names. We we'll call fornication cohabiting. We we'll call lying, being smart, gaining the system. May God help us in Jesus' name. Run to God. And He said, How many people, how many servants are in my father's house and they're eating three square meals? 
and I'm here struggling with the pigs. I was to eat. How many of the servants in my father's house? The Bible said, now he did what? He said, I will arise and go to my father. I will arise. Don't stay there. God is waiting for you. Arise and go to him. He wants to help you. And he was ready to confess to him. He was ready. And one thing I saw, immediately he got to the Father. He was like, I am not worthy. I'm not worthy. I know I blew it. I know that I let you down. And he was rehearsing what he was saying in his mind. It was a long journey back. Remember, he doesn't have money now. He has to trick. A long journey. He was coming back home. I believe he must have rehearsed what he would say a thousand times. Reflecting and thinking. He was ready to be a servant. Just accept me as a servant. And he was coming back home. He was coming back home. The gracious father saw him from afar. He must have looked. He said, that looks like my son from, this, from his steps. That looks like my son. It's like he's coming back. That looks like him. And the father, father left the house. The father stepped out of the house. And said, my son is coming back home. And the Bible said the father started running to him. We need to understand what is happening here. This is not now when we have trousers and sneakers. He's wearing the gown. You can't run with it. And for him to run with it, he needs to pull it up a little bit. He needs to pull it up a little bit. And this is a sign of disgrace for an elder to do. But the son was, father was ready to do whatever it is. I don't care what my neighbors will say. I don't care what the society will say. But one thing I know, my son who was lost has been found. My son who was dead is alive again. My son who was gone is coming back home. I will do whatever it takes to get him back. He started running, running, running. Running. But we say he ran to him. He ran to him. While he was still there, he ran to him. Remember, this man has been with pigs. He's dating. He's unclean, ceremonially unclean. He is dating. And the father ran to him. The father ran, 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 ran. And the Bible said the father hugged him. He was smelling. The father didn't care about the smell. He was dirty. The father did not care about his death. The father hugged him. The father hugged him. And he was trying to do what? To say what he's been rehearsing in his mind. I'm not worthy to be called your son. The father said, no, 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 no. That's not what I'm here for. That is not the reason for me to be here. What I am happy is that you are back home. Father hugged him. Hugged him. And the Bible said, the father kissed him. He's dead. <laughs> if you look at the original word used here that the father kissed him, it means the father could not stop kissing him. He couldn't stop. He was kissing him. He had every way just kissing him. It's like, my son is back. He might be dirty. I don't care. He embraced him. You can't face your life. Only God can face it. So run back. And embrace the grace of your heavenly Father. The Bible said in James chapter 4, verse 8, draw near unto God, and he will draw near unto you. He will draw near. 
Prayer away from your heart. Run to him. Say with me, I will run to God. Always. Run to him. Whenever you see yourself drifting, run back to your father. Run back to him. And tell me, I want you to know, heaven shall rejoice over your return. Heaven shall rejoice over your return. And what did the father do immediately? He arrived. The father brought him into the house and told the servant, quickly, quickly, go and bring the robe. Go and bring the best robe. Put it on him. Put the shoe on him. Give him the ring. The father is restoring his sonship. The father is restoring his sonship. Restoring where he truly belongs. It doesn't matter that he wasted yesterday. God is a God of second chance. He's a God of third chance. He's a God of fourth chance. It does not matter how much you have lost. God is a God who loves you and he can give you a second chance and the father restored his sonship. Say, you're my son. Put the rope on him. Put the ring on him. The one that blew my mind, the father and I gave them instruction. Say, go and kill the fatting calf. The phrase is here, the fattened calf, which means there is one specific calf that has been kept waiting for his return. It's not just killing a calf. It's just not find the biggest one. No, no. Go and kill the fattened calf. I know he's coming back and I've been preparing his return. I know he's coming back. And I've been preparing his return. Our God is the God who knows the end from the beginning. He's the God who can speak into tomorrow. He's the God who knows you. And he has prepared a fatted calf. He said, I am going to celebrate. The day he returns, the day she returns, I'm going to celebrate. And today is that day of celebration. I am killing that fatted calf that I have kept for all these years. Now that he's back, I am killing it. And I'm going to celebrate. I'm going to celebrate. And that's God for you. It's a gracious God. It's a gracious God. But something ironic happened as they were celebrating. The elder son came back. I would say he was very upset. He actually refused to go into the house. He was so angry, he refused to go into the house. Now the father came out. Somebody must have told him, your brother is back, we're celebrating. He said, well, I don't have another brother. He's dead, he's gone, he's not part of my life. He was upset. The message got to the dad. The dad came out. The dad came out. The gracious dad came out. To him. He said, why are you upset? Your brother who was lost has been found. Your brother is here. Don't be angry. Don't be angry. I see a lot of times Christians that are angry at God. Angry. Say, God, I have served you. What is happening in my life? Lord, I kept my body. I know people that did all kinds of things. But they are having children and I'm not. God, I have done this for you. God, I have done that for you. People that have 
I've made sacrifices there. Some of them are just new believers. Things have turned around for them. What about me? God, my friends are getting married. Why am I here? My friends are getting good jobs. Why am I struggling to feed myself? We have questions and we ask God questions. Sometimes we compare ourselves even to unbelievers. The gracious God continues to be gracious. Say, God, I have prayed for this sickness to go. Other people are getting healed. What is happening to me? Why are you not healing me? God said he was so angry. He was so angry. And when the father came to him, he told the father, I have served you for this many years. I have done this for you. And one of the things he said, he said, I have never for once disobeyed you. But this son of yours, he was no longer referred to him as my brother. But this son of yours, who squandered everything, you're celebrating. I want you to know as a believer, everything you do is only by the grace of God. The Bible says it is God who works in us, both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. That you desire to do something good is God. That you actually carry it out is God. Without God, there is no good in you. He was very upset. And it's very crucial. When we serve God, do it without complaining. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, don't complain. Don't complain. Do it without complaining. I love the response of the father. The father says something really beautiful. Father told him in verse 31, Son, you're always with me. Everything I have belongs to you. Daughter, you're always with me. Everything I have is yours. A lot of Christians miss their position as son and daughter. They're only walking to please God. They're operating from that position of a servant. When they are sons and daughters of the Most High God, say, you're always with me and everything I have is yours. What was the father saying? You have access. You have access. And it's very crucial for us to understand and embrace the grace of God. Enjoy the grace of God. Don't stay in the position of just walking to please God. You're not a servant. You're a son. You're a daughter of the most high God. And you can approach your father with boldness to receive help. You can approach your father with boldness, with confidence to receive grace, to approach the throne of grace. He said, you can come. Everything I have is yours. It's yours. They belong to you. You can ask for it. You can enjoy it. Do you know the reason we tend to complain about things? is we think we're doing something for God. We 
think we are doing something for God. Say, God, if I didn't preach, nobody would preach. God, if I didn't sing, nobody would sing. God, if I didn't operate the camera, nobody. God, if I didn't do this, this thing would have suffered. No, 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 no. <laughs> Jesus gave another parable, and the servant came. Even after they did all they did, he said, I am an unworthy servant. When it comes to the things of God, God will make it happen. With or without you. Is somebody hearing me? God will make his things happen. It is only a privilege for us to join God. You know, when, when our kids were very small, I'll be doing something, they want to help us. Or my wife is cooking and my daughter would like to help. But you know, they are joining you would delay the work. Is somebody hearing me? They are, delay, they are joining you would delay the work or even make it complicated. But what do you do with the love of a father and of a mother? You do what? You invite them to experience it is only a privilege you are invited to do things with God and for God Jesus made an outstanding statement he said even if you stop everyone from praising me the stones to praise me He wasn't even like, oh, if you stop these people, God will bring other people. He said, no, no, no. The stones here, they will just start the praise. When you understand that everything you do is by the grace of God, you count it as a privilege to do things for God. Is somebody hearing me? A lot of times we just have this misunderstanding. God, I have been serving you. I have done this for you. I have done that for you. Why are things not working in my life? No, no, you didn't do anything for God. It was only a privilege that he invited you to experience what he's doing. Because God is working. He's always working. With or without you. But he wants you to experience it and see the love of a father. And when you understand that, you can enjoy grace. You're happy to follow God. When you make sacrifices, in quote, you know they are not just sacrifices. They are actually for your own good. And you can approach God, you can talk to God, you can ask God for things, and you just enjoy God. Somebody hearing me? Look at neighbor and say, neighbor, enjoy the grace of God. Look at the next person and say, neighbor, enjoy the grace of God. Enjoy it. You are in the family of God, enjoy that. Be happy. We must start living like sons and daughters and not like slaves, not like servants. It even goes deeper. When Jesus was speaking to the disciples, he said, You're no longer servants, you are now my friends. I can show you secrets. I can show you the deep things of God. Is somebody hearing me? God wants you to develop that intimacy with Him. That you can be authentic with God. You don't envy when somebody gives a testimony. Rather, you celebrate them. Because that's your brother, that's your sister. You're in the family. 